for coming up to this uh, new presentation in support of the campus book read. Uh, the campus book read is uh, started in 2007-2008 with a book called a Refuge. And we've been doing the one a year ever since then. We've had these meetings, we're trying to do six a year. We, didn't, we weren't able to do that last year because of the uh, quarantining and the rules that were in effect then. But this year's book is by James Barilla. It's called uh, his, uh, My Backyard Jungle. And I understand it in terms of uh, interactions between humans and wildlife in suburban and uh, urban spaces. Uh, I was looking at people's Vita online, and I see that Dr. Dada had a, a presentation about uh, black bears and uh, urban and suburban habitats and uh, leptospirosis uh, with those bears. And I thought that would be an excellent addition to uh, illustrate for our students what it is that's involved with uh, another aspect of that issue of human wildlife interactions uh, with the uh, with the research that he has done uh, dr data has more than 15 years of wildlife research and conservation experience with government organizations non-government organizations and communities and stakeholders he's generated and managed a large research project managed and supervised multiple research and con conservation projects he also has experience working with multiple taxa in various countries and landscapes and under different socioeconomic scenarios. He possesses a comprehensive experience in scientific communication, grant proposals, educational research to educational institutions, community, and public speaking to lay and scientific audience. He's developed partnerships, strategies, and done research and management projects in the US, Caribbean islands, India, and the Middle East multiple research co collaborations, uh, capacity building projects, citizen science projects under his belt. He also has nine years experience in graduate, undergraduate, graduate teaching and advising in many in-class and online course developments in the field of biology and wildlife and fisheries. So thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule and coming to speak to us about this. Very much appreciate that. Very much appreciate the contributions of the college and the support that they give to these and to the members of the book greedy uh, group to help choose these books over the years. So thank you. Thank you for, that was quite a mouthful. Yeah. That was, yeah. <laughs> and uh, thank you for that invitation, uh, Dr. Albrightson. And uh, although I haven't finished the book yet, I have it, I, I got it from the bookstores that you had probably left for me. Um, but I haven't finished reading it. I, I hope that in the next couple of weeks I should be done with it. But this is a, a study that we did um, in Asheville or in and around Asheville, North Carolina. Uh, that kind of fits well with the theme of the book, um, urban and suburban wildlife that we, uh, that we see, experience, and essentially live with. Um, that living with heart, we don't realize oftentimes how closely we live with them. But when I, when I talk to my students about, um, about the microbial world and the interaction of the microbial world with us, one example I, I, I give them is um, if you think about your own DNA, you probably have uh, some few million um, A, T, G, and Cs. Those are the nitrogenous bases that you have in your, in your DNA code. Whereas on you at all times lives about 100 times more microbiota in forms of bacteria, in forms of dust mites, invertebrates, in and on your body at all times, you have about a trillion of them. So that makes you more of a, uh, uh, your, your, DR or your, um, your presence more of a microbial presence than your own presence. It actually overwhelms if you just think about the DNA. So you, who you are, is expressed or partially is also expressed by others around you or on you, other DNAs on you. So that I, I always 
make them keep that in the back of their minds. So from that uh, idea, this backyard jungle, it's, it goes from your own or your ecosystem, which is your own body, to an ecosystem that we are living in now or around us. And around us, there are possibly more interactions going on through these microbial interactions, exchanges, zoonosis. We have seen one that's going on right now, um, and we have been riddled by it, um, the coronavirus. Um, so these zoonoses are the exchanges that we see between the animal world and our world and human um, world, human environment, is probably more um, in, the, in the order of 100 times more than we perceive it to be. Okay? So from, from that, that point of view, or keeping that in mind, we'll go into this discussion. What we did is we studied black bears around Asheville, North Carolina. We collected their, um, so this graduate student, Nick, and I should give the credits here before I go any farther. Nicholas Gould, uh, he was a graduate student at the time um, with uh, North Carolina State University. Indrani, she wrote the paper. She, uh, her and I, we um, designed the experiment side of things, data analysis side of things, and all the other authors were somehow uh, helped us out with that. Uh, Chris, Chris DiPerno, the last author in there, you, you see he was also instrumental in getting the grant. And Nicholas Gould was the grad student who, uh, who did that. Um, Anil, um, um, Dr. Chang, they did the um, microbial analysis um, at Cornell. That's where the, um, the MAT PCR tests were done. Samples were analyzed. But what I'll, I'll talk about the study a little bit today, and then we can go into the discussions, and we can, we can bring out our own experiences with, with wildlife around us, um, and, and how that matches up with the book read, relates with the book read anyway. So the primary objectives of the study, let me go and talk about the study a little bit, then we can um, look at the results and what it really means. Our primary objectives was to see if there were any leptospira in black bears around Asheville, which obviously we knew that there were. We just needed evidence of it, and we wanted to see across that gradient of housing densities, um, so we divided it into um, five different gradations of housing densities, and I can give you that number a little bit uh, later. Let me see. So it goes from it goes from very low five to twenty nine houses per square kilometer to low thirty to one hundred and sixty eight houses, medium one hundred and sixty nine to three hundred and seven houses, um, and high three hundred and eight to four four hundred and forty six houses, and very high four hundred and forty seven to twelve hundred and sixty seven. So based on densities there. We had estimated <coughs> that there are, we categorized them into these five groups. So we were interested to see what the prevalence of leptospira, which is a bacterial spirochete. It's a spiral bacteria. It's present in all our pets. We are, all the pets are vaccinated for it. Um, it can be present in all vertebrates, essentially. You see it in rodents. All sorts of rodents, you see it in skunks, badgers, you see it in um, um, coons, all mice, um, all, again, all, all sorts of rodents. You also see it in dogs, cats, uh, cattle, all our livestock, essentially. You also see it in uh, um, reptiles and amphibians around us as well. So they are ubiquitous, if you will. So we wanted to see in black bear what levels of that, again, there are several servers of it, 
the one that we looked at was Gryptotyphosa, uh, but there are several different types. The reason we looked at that server is, is because that's the common one that you find in domestic dogs. So we wanted to see that relationship there. Um, one of our objectives also was to um, see if the housing density had anything to do with the spread of lepto or the prevalence of lepto in, in these bears. We also wanted to see if there is any link with movement. For example, if females with young um, that, uh, that live close to high, higher density houses because of food access, uh, is the number higher in them? Also, are the young that move around much more than the older adults, do, do they have a higher prevalence of lepto in them or, or not? So those were some of the initial objectives that we had that we wanted to check using our data. <clears throat> so we got our hands on, on around 125 bears. Of that, we actually used 96 of them, um, or the data represents 96. 47 of them were females, 47 males. So you, we had a really good spread between male and female. Um, that was not all, uh, true for adults and sub-adults. Um, and then we did two kinds of tests, uh, microscopic agglutination test and MAT. That's the same as immunohistochemistry test where you look for antibodies. So once any pathogen infects the body, we develop antibodies to it. The same concept that vaccines, we are all getting vaccines these days. Most of us, we are getting vaccines these days. I, I hope we are all getting vaccines uh, uh, down the road. <coughs> so uh, with response to that pathogen, these bears develop antibodies. And these antibodies remain in the system um, for sometimes their entire life. So, and these antibodies, our presence of these antibodies would tell us that in the past, the bear must have been exposed to the bacteria, to Leptospira, one of the Leptospira species. We were looking for um, Gryptotyphosa, like I said, for that serovore and antibodies specific to that serovore. And we also did PCR tests, that's the polymerase chain reaction test. You are familiar with it because we have all gone through RT-PCR test uh, because of the COVID, or a lot of us have. Um, and that test tests for the actual pathogen or the DNA of the actual pathogen. So PCR tests would be indicating acute infection that's going on right now in the bears whereas the um, MAT tests would indicate if they were exposed in the past because it's the antibody that we are testing. And the antibodies do not show up in enough concentration until about 10 days. So any bear that has an acute infection, we are testing it for MAT, we may not find antibodies until about 10 days. Okay, so we'll only start seeing the antibodies in good numbers um, at or after 10 days. <clears throat> um, we also collected tissue samples from um, the bears that we found dead. They were either killed by collision or uh, starvation. <clears throat> so there were a few uh, reasons that we could conclude from those carcasses, but um, not all the bears were in good enough shape so that we can um, get those samples, tissue samples. So we got tissue samples from kidneys and bladders because that's the route uh, that this uh, excuse me, bacteria takes. So it's passed on through urine to the soil and it remains active in the soil for about a few hours. Under certain temperature and pH, uh, it likes alkaline soil. So it remains active in alkaline soil longer. A temperature above um, around 22 degree Celsius. That's what it prefers as well. Um, so of those, um, we got about 12 positive results. Of those, there were uh, four females, five males with titers uh, ranging from between one and uh, 200 
levels of dilution, and one is to 3,200 levels of dilution, and the other, uh, where about, one is to 100 level of dilution. So that indicates that at what dilution you are still able to see these antibodies. And it's important in serological studies where you need to be able to find these antibodies um, or, or and need to be able to detect these antibodies at different dilutions and then the, the best um, visible dilution is reported in, in these articles. So um, again, all these titers were greater than 1 is to 100 um, and ranged from uh, that to about 1 is to 3,200. Um, using PCR, we tested about 55 females, um, and these were all um, carcasses that we, that we found. There were two bladders, about six kidneys, and 47 serum samples, and 68 males. Um, there we found uh, seven bladders, 14 kidneys from these dead individuals, and also 47 serum samples from live individuals. And a total of 125 samples is what we had collected, representing um, a total of 96 um, individuals. Um, none of the MAT positive animals, so this is the antibody, just to remind you, uh, test had corresponding PCR results that came positive. In other words, all the individuals that showed past exposure did not show current um, acute infection which is through that PCR result. However, we did not rule out possibility of other serovirs. The only serovir that we looked at was the Gripotyposa. Um, but there can be other serovirs of that uh, same species in that region as well, which we did not look at. This is the area. So that's the uh, limits of the city in um, black boundary there, uh, so that's the um, legend there. You have a couple of interstates passing through, business routes passing through as well. Um, so that is the buffer, I'm sorry. So that is the two kilometer buffer that we imposed on the city limit. Um, and then there is um, the, the county that we studied it in is that grayish or whitish line. That's the um, Bancombe, Bancombe County. In there, um, so what you're looking at color-wise is the, the red is the urban development that has kind of, and you can see it typically follows the roadways. You see on the two sides of the roadways how they're kind of spreading. So those are all larger roads, roadways, concentrated in the center, obviously. Um, and the green dots in here are the positive bears, the ones that were detected positive for leptospirosis. Um, so that's the uh, kind of a, the, the spatial bird's eye view of where we found those bears. I'll spend some time on these results quick. Um, so here are all the bear IDs that we detected. Each time we got a bear, we also marked it, a live bear. We marked it with tattoo on the inner lip. Uh, it received an ear tag and a radio collar so that we can track them, so that we know where they're moving around. Um, so these are, the again, the sex and their approximate ages. Some of them that we couldn't age properly, we just called them adults. Um, yearling, and then um, the, the ones that we could age using their teeth, um, those are the numbers up there, with some error, obviously. Um, specimen that we analyzed, these are serum, so those all went through the MAT test, and then kidney and bladder went through the PCR test, as well as, um, or these um, serum went through both tests, kidney and bladder went through the PCR tests primarily. Um, and then the OD is um, occupancy distribution, and when we say 95%, that's 
all the points that we found of a bear, um, except the, the outliers, are 95% of the points is what area this represents. Okay, so, um, and you can see it varies all the way from about 4 to 40. That's the range of, um, you, you, you have probably heard the term home range. So this is like a home range size of, of those bears. Uh, and you can see um, the females have smaller home ranges, whereas the males have larger home ranges. So that's typical in, in uh, Say that? Those you ascertain Using the collars, yes. As the collars are the data from the, those were GPS collars, so they were, uh, they sent data to these computers, and that's how we got these numbers. And then these are the housing densities. You can see most of them are in the moderately low. There's only one that's in the high category, which indicates that if they are present in the low density areas where we have detected them, doesn't mean that they're not there in the high density areas. It just means they're everywhere. If they're present in low density areas, they have to be present in high density areas as well. Um, that's kind of implied. And then these are the serover percents. You can see it goes up to 3,200, 1 is to 3,200 to about um, um, 100. And for the PCR tests, only one of those, two, three, three of those were positive. The rest of them were negative for PCR. So this is the mat, mat result. Then we modeled the um, variation in the data and what came up. So in this type of modeling, you put in your variables. You tell that, OK, this is my information about um, positive versus negative detection. Um, and this is my related information. Um, so that includes uh, age of the bear. That includes sex of the bear. That includes housing density. That includes um, um, what else did we put in? Vegetation, different vegetation types. That includes proximity to roads, distances from roads. That includes distances from farmsteads. All those information were given to the um, software. And it did its simulations and found that, again, there was not much association with um, any of the variables per se. But the one thing that it explained most variation in the data was housing density. In other words, that came back as the top model explaining most of the variation. In other words, if you look, go back to the previous slide, because they were all in that moderately low um, housing density area, that's why that was the model it picked. So it picked a model that uh, told us that, okay, housing density was probably the biggest um, explainer of variables in the data, which really didn't mean much because uh, we know that if they're present in these low, low density areas, it's just because of chance we didn't document them from other areas. So that model, Again, it's, it's, a, it's a good practice to report your data even though it doesn't mean a whole lot. So that's the, one of the reasons that we are reporting this data. But if you look at the fourth model, that was one of the top models. So it gives you a list of, let's say, 20 models. So within the top model, we have um, housing density as well as housing density with age and sex in that top four models as well which gives us some confidence that there is relationship between who, based on their sex and age, are being tested positive more often than others. So sex and age also had some significance in it. And if I go back,
If I go back, you can see most of the ages are younger. One, two, one, two, two, um, yearling. So there is a clear relationship between movement and that was the next analysis that we are, we are planning to do and maybe in the next couple of years that will be done, is, is to see if age and movement rates has any influence on prevalence of lepto or any other disease for that matter. The more you move, the more you tend to get exposed. And the same thing we have seen with COVID as well, right? We were asked to limit our movement, quarantine ourselves so that we are not exposed. That's the same concept here as well. The more you move around, the more the opportunities of you getting uh, the, or exposed to that pathogen. <clears throat> and then again, uh, this is, we got the odds ratio. Odds ratio indicates anything close to one. Um, there's no uh, reason or there's no explanation for it. What we expected and what we observed is essentially the same. The higher than one or the more it goes above one, there is less or avoidance. The more, if it's lower than one, so let's say 0.5 would be preference and 1.5 would be avoidance to a certain characteristic. And these uh, are um, the um, explaining variables. So housing density, again, in odds ratio terms, didn't have much impact, it seemed. Sex had a little bit of impact, so male versus female. But the most impact that you have seen uh, is the subadult and yearling, which had 1.1 and 1.6, which indicates that um, the younger they were, they were probably more prone to getting lepto because they were moving around a little more, a lot more than others, a lot more than the adults. So in conclusion, we found that they, they must be ubiquitous in this entire um, urban, suburban gradient around, around Asheville. They were not strictly limited to densely populated areas. They were actually documented from less developed areas. Um, all of our, or most of our representative bears were from um, low, moderately low populated areas um, with higher concentration of human development there will be a greater chance of spread as well. Because they, uh, again, they are density dependent factors. Disease is one of those density dependent factors with greater density, it spreads quickly. Um, black bears are capable of transmitting, they're not end hosts, in other words. Dogs, for example, can be end hosts of lepto, but not bears. Bears always transmitted or can transmit it to others. Um, our, we have talked about MAT and how it's um, sensitive after 8 to 10 days PCR within the first 10 days because this is actively seeking out um, lepto DNA, whereas MAT is actively seeking out the antibodies um, developed by the bear's body. 9% um, was positive uh, from MAT, 2% from PCR. In comparison, other studies have found um, one in uh, Idaho that was done in north central Idaho uh, that found about, <sighs> trying to think now, less, lower. So maybe six or seven percent there. And then there was another one done in Maryland that had higher prevalence there. Um, but our estimates were conservative. So we may have missed, but we, what we documented was, um, was for sure there, in other words. We may have missed some. So our estimates is a direct derivation of what we have found or what we have um, found positive was documented here. So anything else was not do uh, documented, was not um, part of this 
reporting, therefore, our estimate was conservative. There were multiple tissue that were found to be affected, not just kidneys and bladders. Uh, there were other tissue that we had uh, uh, tested as well, and they were also positive for lepto. Um, this serover, Gripotyphosa, is found in dogs, so we know that there is a direct association of um, these species with or, or, or the, uh, um, the, the bears and our, our pets, our household um, animals that, that we live with can exchange these uh, serovers um, with, with the wildlife. And uh, infected animals would shred it through their urine, survival dependent on temperature, um, alkaline soil. They also need moisture. And obviously, all the um, regular recreational activities that we do may expose us to lepto, given that it's in the environment at this high, higher rate. Um, I think that is all I have for the study. And if you have any questions or any um, points, comments, we can discuss those now. So if I get leptospirosis, mm -hmm. Uh, in humans, the symptoms are not too bad. You'll get some headache, you'll get some nausea, um, often vomiting, that type of tendencies. Um, but it'll, it'll pass fairly easily. Yeah, it's, it's not a, not a life-threatening condition. Is it for dogs? Uh, for dogs, it can be life-threatening, yes. So what's the vaccine for? You said they give dogs shots for it. Yes. Um, Lepto vaccine has parts of the bacteria, so that just triggers an immune response and and. Uh, I wonder if my dog gets a shot. I would doubt that. I don't know. But even dogs that get the vaccine can get other servers as well. It just goes to show that it's a the bacteria, it? it is a bacteria. It's a um, spirochete, a spiral bacteria. It goes to show that um, it's not just lepto, but these um, or the wildlife that's around us um, also may have other stuff as well that, that can be, that we are constantly getting exposed to. Not saying it's a bad thing. Um, that's, a, that's the debate, that's the discussion we can have, but um, we are getting exposed to it regardless. That's a fact. <laughs> but it's there in coons. The most uh, skunks, skunks have been found to be the biggest spreader so far. 45% of skunks have lepto. Coons, skunks. Squirrels? Squirrels, yeah. That's what I see when I think of wildlife. Yeah. Wildlife, it's the nicer bird and more dangerous. Yeah, they, they all have lepto. So is that, so if you, what happens if you use them? You would cook them at a high temperature, so those bacteria would be destroyed by that. Because my brother, my brother shoots squirrels in his yard. But they are not as predominantly found in muscle tissue, in the meat, in other words. So they are, they are not, they don't survive very long in muscle tissue. Did you say as a part of this that the bear population is increasing? Uh, area where you were working did the study? Um, that was a different study. I think okay. Nick was part of that as well, but I think population is increasing. The bear I'm population is increasing. curious about is in increasing. Gorilla, in the chapter on the backyard ruins, it talks about how there were about 3,000 black bears in Massachusetts before European colonization. By 1900, it had dropped to about 100. And he said at the time of the publication of this, the bear population has reached 3,000 again in Massachusetts and is increasing by 8 to 10 percent each year. Um, wow. it, why is that? Resource. If you have resources, why not increase in number? No, they're, they're adapting to urban areas. Yeah. But why, well. why is it dropped to 100 and from... Because of exploitation, rampant uh, killing and all. 
There's so no that problem. would be human caused. Yeah. They, they, the bear shows up and they kill him. Yeah. Um, okay. I think, you know, I, I think in our own area, when I was a child, we rarely saw an Indian goose. And for a hunter to shoot one was a big deal where I grew up. Now, and now they're, they're pissed. Oh, <laughs> right around mine up, there's a huge flock of them in the park. Yeah. And they just adapt to the urban areas. And, yeah. and I, my under, I've, I've read that coyotes have adapted very well to urban areas. Urban suburban areas, excellent adaptation. Yeah, coyotes are one of the best. That's how they have spread down there now as well. The Southeast never seen coyotes. Now they are hybridizing with uh, with wolves. Yeah. It's a koi wolf, and it's a it's a fertile offspring, so it's breeding as well. They're very prevalent because almost I let the dog out last at night to explain, and they're home. No, no, but but, I, but I, you get a town. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh, I have put cameras. Very much so, yeah. I put cameras in uh, Forestry Park. We do that every year. Every year I document coyotes and foxes. Mm -hmm. yeah. There was That's one last year with the, with, with the mange, uh, oh, fox with the mange. Boy. I wanted to. I I, yeah. That's the other I one. I worry about that one. I go off my dog mm -hmm. every day, about three times. Into the field, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. They adapt very well. And that's the thing the species that adapts to these changing conditions survives and, and thrives, really. Um, that we have seen. I, I studied raptors for my graduate uh, degree. Uh, and I and I so this is Logan Macintosh Dickey Keter um, and what's the other county seal um, east of Logan anyway um, east of Logan is Lamore right. Lamour is just east of Logan. So those, oh. those counties. And in the 70s, Ferruginous hawks were the main hawk. 80% of the community of raptors, birds of prey, were Ferruginous hawk. And the rest were um, red tails, um, great horned owls, and so on. Now, uh, I did this study in 2013 through 15. The main hawk, the biggest hawk, is Swainson's. Swainson's were only documented maybe one or two nests at the time. And Swainson's, which are generalists, they would eat what's in season. They would eat frogs and toads when they're migrating. They would salamanders. They would eat snakes. They would eat uh, roadkill. Uh, uh, they would e eat insects. They winter in Argentina. And there, they're almost 80% of their diet is insects. So because being a, being a generalist, and this is the hawk that you'll see following a tractor around um, the whole time, and whatever is coming out, they would go and get it. So Swainson's are the biggest contributor in that community now. Virginus hawk is about 10% now. What do they eat? Virginus hawk always um, capitalizes on larger prey. They're very selective in their prey selection. They don't like to nest in, uh, in tall trees. They always nest low in the trees or on the ground. So ground-based disturbance have increased, so they have moved to trees. All the uh, nests I found east of the river, Missouri, were on the trees. West of the river, they were right on the ground. Okay, so they had to change, couldn't adapt, so were uh, almost eradicated now, if you will. Huh. But now they have adapted to those conditions. The and one thing I noticed also was the birds were smaller. 
the birds in the 70s and progenocide hawk always takes a certain size of band. We were banding all these birds. Our bands were six A's. Phylogenus hawk is not even documented in the banding book to get six A's. We banded most birds with six A's. So the bird is getting smaller as well. That's a response to the food that it's hunting. Smaller bird can be more maneuverable, can hunt smaller prey better, surviving better, therefore numbers increasing, so we are seeing more smaller individuals than larger individuals. Whereas all my birds west of the river were larger bodied birds. They didn't even take one 6A band. So the birds are different. The, the smaller birds, it took them how long to uh, adapt? To the that would be for a long time, but I'm already seeing several birds taking six eggs. Really? Yeah. So which is which indicates that the birds are getting smaller. So they are nesting in Argentina and coming here. Yeah, swings itself. That's a long trip. <laughs> That's a huge uh, 2,500 mile trip. Um, and they, they do it in very short bouts. They get here in like late April, May, and they're the first one to leave as well. They leave in October. Now the snowy owl. They are here. They come from the Arctic. Right, they come from north. And the rough-legged hawk, they are also here. That's on scene couple already. Yeah. They came from north to winter here. They'll winter here. They are hard to lose. Oh, yeah. <laughs> they kill pheasants and partridge. Yeah. And they would they would hang around those farms and they would go after them. Tell you why you flock a partridge one less one less. <laughs> we have a lot of birds that have to go a lot. Um, I think Jeremy was uh, speaking, but um, we also have a great horn owl that Dale has seen. And that's one of the reasons we're, we were a little scared to take the dog with us because he's 10 pounds. <laughs> and I, I know that, well, the neighbor who farms our land saw the great horn, the, the owl swoop down at his dog. And his dog was like this. And it finally went up thinking, oh, maybe he's a little big for me, you know? Well, it probably wasn't a, a Prey move. It was probably yeah, a scaring move. Okay. It probably has a nest, okay. so it's trying to scare it. Oh, did you see the Wow. Yeah. 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 It's a little bit of a scare. It they're, is. They're, they're big. I, I I used to climb nests to look at eggs, band chicks, and all. Every time I would attempt it. So for the ground ones, they will always be on a like a mound. Thing. So while I'm climbing, these birds are swooping down on me and they use the sun. So you, you don't see them until they're right here in uh -huh. your face. Because when you look up, you see the sun, the bird is right there. You don't, you don't see it. Um, so they would get really close. I've not, never been clawed. I mean, I've been clawed while the bird was in my hand, but I've never been clawed like that. But it was always a, a, a scare move, oh. kind of a, they don't kill a pheasant like that for me. Probably on my cell phones at home. But I hit a bird. Ooh, that's a kill. I had to go. So, open air hit. I don't remember the name of it. Went off to get it. It's snowing all in front of us. Swooped. Got it. Flew off. We got closer. Do you have a one o'clock class? I do have one more okay. class. Yes. Okay. Um, thank you, Sean. This was oh, thank you. That was very interesting. I, I yes. love to do this. Yeah. I, uh, I'm especially interested uh, in when you walk us through this report. I'm always telling my students that uh, even if you don't have a PhD, uh, you can get some sense out of a primary source study if you look at the abstract and the introduction. And the oh, absolutely, yeah. And I'm thinking um, some <laughs> of the things that you were telling us in the discussion part of that. Somebody that does have a PhD can see some of the limitations. Like you, that was a revelation that you would report data that really isn't 
significant. They did not make significant. And nobody would know that unless they had training in there. And, but you can get a general idea looking at right, the back and draw a conclusion from it. Yeah, and, and even even like if someone is uh, talking about them in simple terms, because a lot of the statistical studies that are done today, I have no idea how, how they were done. So they need to be explained by that individual who did that study, who knew those parameters, who knew those assumptions. So it's always, uh, I mean, not all the studies I understand if I read it, mm -hmm. really, because they are statistical analysis. There are several different kinds, and not all of them I'm, I'm, uh, I'm really familiar with. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it, it doesn't need a PhD for to understand. This really. You get the general idea, yeah. maybe some of the nuance. Absolutely. Well. And that's yeah. all you need. But you help them. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. I do have one question that it has very little to do specifically with this, but I have heard that COVID could um, manifest in animals. Mm -hmm. But you don't hear of it very often. But now, did they just say two? Uh, was it snow leopards died from COVID? So cats can get it. How oh, so snow leopards? Reverse zoonosis. Zoo. Well, they, they were in a zoo. Yeah, in a yeah. Zoo. yeah. Tigers. There's tigers that died. Tigers too, that have it? gotten it. I yeah. don't think. Uh, oh, they have died. I don't think it had died okay. though. But it had, it was reported to have uh, gotten it from visitors. I guess. Yeah. They are vaccinating primates, monkeys, um, gorillas, um, right now with COVID vaccine, so that they don't get it from visitors, or even staff who are really close wow. to them. Huh. Yeah. yeah, they are vaccinating in all the all the zoos. They are starting to anyway. Is the same vaccination is good for all mammals? Yes. Really? Yes. Similar. It's slightly different. Some of the conjugates are slightly different. They have to tweak the yeah. potion a little bit. Say that? They have to tweak the potion a little bit if they right. try to give it to a cat? Right. Oh, okay. So but cats they are, are the most prone, but any... Animal? Primates. Primates are the most okay. prone because they are so oh, close okay. to us. They're, yeah. All their cell receptors are very similar to us. Yeah. Thank so, you. We'll be back yeah. here at yeah. 7 with more yeah. questions. Yeah. <laughs>